Uh, hey guys, uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, it'll be super quick because it's lightning. <laughs> I'll try to uh, be as uh, crisp as possible and uh, show you how you can sort of hypothesize and uh, create experiments in, in your mind and then re re reflect the same in, in Litmus or any chaos tool possibly. So this is my topic. Uh, uh, we want to think like chaos engineers and simulate uh, anomalies the uh, Litmus way. A little bit about me as uh, I'm a senior software engineer to wear harness and uh, I'm also a maintainer of Litmus and uh, I've been participating in LFX and uh, mentoring a lot of uh, folks to join a Litmus contribute and just like it and to do it in my spare time and uh, I'm a chaos engineering practitioner. So I know this is a chaos engineering conference and uh, I don't want to take a lot of time diving into what is chaos engineering because you guys already know but just in case this is your first session uh, just a quick recap uh, it is a process of testing your distributed uh, system by breaking them and seeing if they are capable enough to withstand the uh, pressure and if uh, you can potentially mitigate outages in your production environment if, with this practice moving on uh, some of the challenges that we see typically in you know common user scenarios so uh, in the cfp i did mention a few examples and then when i was creating this talk i thought why not just talk about those scenarios but this could be anything uh, to be honest i just picked uh, the three that i mentioned but uh, what we'll do is we'll take a look at these scenarios and uh, how we can sort of uh, visualize the scenarios what happens and then uh, hypothesize uh, on these so to start off we have something which is very common called the rapid login attempt so popular websites like uh, Amazon, Walmart, shopping websites basically um, can have a huge number of people trying to log in at the same time. So this could happen when there's a, like a sales promotion or you know a lot of uh, activity on the sales channel. So Amazon, Walmart, like I mentioned, often see a lot of uh, login attempts during events like Black Friday, Cyber Monday, things like that. And it puts a lot of pressure on the system, causing them to slow down or even fail. Um, and also another scenario could be the bulk data upload. This could be your storage services like Google Drive or Dropbox, uh, where many people start uploading large files at once. Uh, this could happen because um, of a new feature or some popular something going on. Uh, for example, when Google Drive uh, updates or shares some new features or when it tries to, you know, uh, a lot of people try to upload at the same time. So this can overload the system. Of course, this doesn't happen with Google. I'm just taking an example. This can overload the system and it can cause delays or make it harder for others to use the service. Uh, lastly, we have uh, high concurrent requests, which imagine you're using a social media platform like Facebook or Twitter, and suddenly you get a lot of requests from users all at once. So this would happen in you know bigger news events or um, when people check their feed at the same time. It, this happens specifically for bigger events like uh, FIFA World Cup or IPL in India. So yeah, it can overrun the servers and slow down the platform overall, and this can affect the user's experience. Now, what is uh, the problem with uh, with these uh, scenarios? So in, when it comes to rapid login, when too many people try to log in, one is it can overload the authentication system. Uh, this can lead to delays, errors in the login process. There's also a higher risk of brute force attacks or attempts to crack password because your system is vulnerable at this point of time. And in some cases, it can even lead to denial of service or DOS uh, attack, which can make the website unavailable to real users for a few minutes or seconds. Uh, depends on how resilient your system is. Uh, for bulk data upload, uh, when a lot of people are uploading larger files, it can sort of overload the storage as mentioned. Uh, this causes delays, errors, and also the high disk usage increases the risk of uh, data corruption or data loss, which we do not want. And additionally, uh, the more network activity you have, it creates like an opening, I would say, for data breaches because, uh, again, your system is vulnerable and you can have a lot of unauthorized access. Uh, lastly, concurrent, with concurrent requests, uh, we see uh, the same sort of overload, uh, overload, uh, overload in the platform's infrastructure. And this can cause delays or errors in processing these uh, requests, which can lead to uh, service being unavailable or even uh, downtimes due to the, the high load. And that is something we want to mitigate, specifically downtime. So um, let's take one scenario uh, at a time. Now we'll move quicker throughout the talk uh, as we talk about the other ones. But let's take some time on the first one so that we understand how we identify uh, what faults or how to choose faults. So once we do the hypothesis one, we'll 
pretty much goes smoother for the re remaining ones. But for the first hypothesis, we have broken down um, the step into three different parts. One is the why. It's not really the why, but it's more of uh, what exactly is happening with my system and what could I possibly think of. Uh, so you just stop yourself at the what. You don't think beyond. At this point, you just think about what exactly is happening and how probably uh, I could mitigate or like what probable scenarios could happen. So this is the what stage or, you know, the why what stage. So in this case, uh, there's a possibility of a sudden surge in the CPU usage if we talk about the rapid login. And also this could lead to the increased load of the system. So this is where you take like a uh, step back and you think of the what. Now next you, you're like, what are we exactly planning to test? So this exactly tests the resource allocation, your system's resource allocation and uh, prioritization mechanism. And also it uh, sort of, uh, sort of we want to understand how the system responds to heavy load and identify any potential bottlenecks. So this ensures it can handle like a large number of users logging in at the same time. So we want to check the number of CPU intensive tasks it can do basically. And then we move into the possible outcome. So once I do some sort of chaos uh, with this thing in mind, what should be the possible outcome? So during the test, we might observe that the system becomes unresponsive. That could be one. Uh, we see a significant slowdown, another one. Um, and, you know, of course, the slowdown and crashes due to the high CPU usage. So we'll also be looking for errors in the system logs and uh, any increase in latency or uh, drop in the number of uh, successful login attempts. So all of this is like the possible outcomes. And we end with the mitigation takes place. So our mitigation definitely has to take place. Then you can call it a resilient system. So this is the whole uh, hypothesis journey. So you need to question yourself about the what. Uh, you need to understand what it uh, actually tests and the possible outcomes from that test. Now, what you can do is for litmus, you can go to hub.litmuschaos.io and then you can um, select or type the keywords or the actions. In this case, I've typed CPU, you can type memory, you can type hog, or you can type load, things like that. And then you can select or you know, you, you'll get the list obviously, and then you can select which um, fault you want to choose. So in, in my case, based on what we just uh, discovered, the pod CPU hog seems to be the perfect choice. So that is what we pick. Now let's do this exercise one more time with the same hypo like the same hypothesis, the same scenario, but this will be a much more uh, faster one. So now we basically want to test how the system manages. So this is the next step now. We want to test how the system manages increased memory usage uh, when many users try to log in at the same time. So this could help see if the system can handle the extra load without slowing down or failing. So first we would inject high memory usage into the pod that handles the login request. We'll simulate the strain that would happen during the login attempt. We'll also observe how the login service responds. We might want to increase, see the increased latency for uh, which will sort of mean that we we'll want to see the users logging in or even errors in the memory usage uh, and the usage getting high. We'll also want to monitor the system's response. Ideally see the system's monitoring tools uh, can detect the high memory usage or not. And if the system has auto scaling or load balancing mechanisms in place. So the possible outcomes from them will be uh, we might see the login service becoming unresponsive or uh, noticeably slow. The monitoring tools that we use uh, should be picking up on this and triggering alerts. That is a main thing. And if the system is well prepared, uh, we should be also seeing uh, auto scaling or load balancing mechanisms kick in. So now that we have these uh, conditions, we would typically move in for something which involves a lot of memory fault. So we choose pod memory hog. The reason we are using pod memory hog is uh, this fault intentionally increases the memory usage on the specific pod, particularly the one managing the login request. So by doing this, we can uh, observe how the system handles a certain increase in memory demands. So this will help us understand the system's ability to scale, balance load, and maintain performance when we have a heavy load. So that is. Uh, one way we can identify using hypothesis and then choose the specific fault. Now you can mix and match the, these two in this case. So then uh, your typical chaos experiment would be part CPU hog plus part memory hog and uh, something more uh, based on your hypothesis. We'll move on to the next one, which is the bug data upload. This is our hypothesis too. So in this, we aim to test how the system responds when the disk starts uh, to, you know, the disk space starts to run out due to the bulk data uploads. 
so this helps us in if the system can still uh, function smoothly if it encounters errors or any sh any shutdowns. Moving on to the step by step uh, fault injection, we'll see the uh, first we'll see if the if the fault fills up the disk space. That is one thing we would want to perform on the pods that is responsible for handling the data upload. Uh, the simulation also happens when a large number of files are uploaded at once. We can also observe the data upload service to see if the experiences are, uh, we see any errors or anything in the experience and if you see a slowdown. We would also want to check if the system monitors and uh, there's any monitoring or alerting tools that is detecting the same. And if the system has uh, any disk cleanup process or scaling mechanisms. Uh, some of the possible outcomes from this would be the data upload service might become slow or even stop working if the disk fill, fills up completely. Uh, and also the system's monitoring tool should detect the problem as mentioned before. So if the system is set up correctly, it should be able to handle the situation by either cleaning up the disk space or scaling resources to manage the load. Now, again, uh, we would prefer something similar to the process we mentioned. So when we do the process, we come up with pod disk fill. So we are using this uh, fault to deliberately fill up the disk space on the specific pod, particularly the one handling your data uploads. And by doing this, you can observe how the system manages uh, low disk space conditions. So this would help us understand if the system can effectively clean up disk space, scale resources, and also maintain the services. OK, uh, next one. So we want to handle, we want to see how uh, this uh, sort of uh, bulk data produces like a high stress or a high IO activity caused by the bulk data upload. So we can, this sort of uh, will help us identify the potential issues with the disk IO management and also the caching mechanism we have in place. So to simulate this, we can do a high IO activity. You can simulate a high IO activity by creating a scenario where a large amount of data are uploaded. So this generally kind of, uh, you would sort of generate like a lot of uh, disk IO and caching activity in the simulation. So we also want to monitor the same for the obvious reasons. And we want to check the system's memory management and garbage collection mechanism through this. So the, during the test, uh, you might see out of memory OOM errors, uh, some increased latency, even system crashes due to IO stress, and also uh, signs of the system's uh, memory management and IO under heavy load. So this would definitely um, require something which can do an IO stress probably. So we end up choosing pod IO stress which is a, a fault that simulates high IO activity. This uh, fills up the disk space on a pod and uh, leads to an increased IO and caching activity. So this helps test how the system manages disk IO and also how you can handle larger uh, data uploads effectively. Now moving on to the final one, which is the high concurrency. This is the final hypothesis. So if we want to test uh, systems network communication, uh, we would probably want to inject something which can check issues with the network splits, uh, like issues that can cause when you're, you have a network partition uh, or when the network space basically. So this represents like the effect of high concurrency requests that can lead to network problems. Uh, now during this test, you might also see network related errors, uh, increased latency, timeouts uh, as the system struggles to handle these uh, concurrent requests. So there would definitely be like a decrease in the number of uh, uh, successful request, that is number one, and that would be a key indicator for the potential issue. So we end up choosing something like a pod network partition, which is the fault that simulates uh, uh, network partitions, helps us test how the system deals with network splits and high level concurrency requests. Now, finally, this is the last hypothesis, which uh, we are in which we are sort of testing the uh, system to manage and recover from container failure. So let's say you drop an entire container or something, then that also causes like a gap in the system because of the high volumes of concurrent requests. It might happen that you're one of the containers is down. So we simulate a container failure by intentionally killing the container uh, that are handling these high request volumes. And during this test, you might see um, errors or downtimes as the system struggles to handle the concurrency requests because it will try to look for the container related uh, it will try to look for the container and then you'll also see the container related errors in your logs. And of course, this will lead to latency because it's not ready yet. So to choose uh, the fault, it's pretty obvious. We'll be choosing something like container kill, which can uh, you know help us test how the system deals with container crashes and also errors under high load uh, conditions. So yeah, I think by this, we'll sort of observe how the system can uh, manage your uh, containers and also if the restart mechanisms is in place. Now, let's say uh, you have a custom requirement and you do not uh, find what you're looking for here. So 
you can use the Litmus SDK. It provides an easy way to bootstrap your experiments and create necessary artifacts. Uh, this SDK also helps you generate custom chaos experiments and include default pre and post chaos uh, checks to monitor the status of your uh, application before and after the experiment. So typically this is, this is how it will look like. So you can clone the Git uh, Litmus Go uh, repository and you'll find the Litmus SDK there. So you can generate your own uh, type and there's an attribute YAML file which you have to fill based on your custom artifacts and then you can apply the same. Uh, there's a wonderful blog in the uh, Litmus Chaos.io slash blogs written by Shubham one of the maintainers, uh, you can check that out. It has a full uh, you know, overview of uh, things you can do probably. And with that, I end my talk. Thank you. I hope you learn how to sort of hypothesize and um, think about creating new uh, chaos scenarios. Hey, Cyan, thanks for this lightning talk. Um, I always enjoy it because you've literally ran all these chaos tests before, so you're speaking from truth and the heart and everything. So it's a great, great experience there. Uh, just a couple of questions I threw in. Um, people are being kind of quiet with questions, which is OK. But you know, I asked the first couple, so it hopefully encourages others. Yeah. Um, first question for you, um, how has thinking like a chaos engineer helped you be more confident in incident response? Mm, OK, um, I think. Um... As you think uh, like a chaos engineer and do more of these uh, strategies and uh, hypothesize and you know kind of rep repeat these uh, experiments, you sort of become confident on uh, your system. But of course, it sort of uh, gives you the ability to anticipate failures, which is a little powerful because when you do this more uh, and you start thinking like a, like a chaos engineer, then you sort of know that uh, you sort of you know force the uh, and prepare for the potential issues that could happen. It also, I think, enhances your troubleshooting skills in, in, in a certain sense when something breaks because you have the knowledge, you sort of jump right in and know how certain components interact and fail and you can diagnose things easily. And also I think uh, it makes your resilience strategies much more stronger because you have like a refined strategy to you know sort of make your systems more resilient. So it, it's like you do more preparation work because when the thing happens, you're ready because you're thinking like a uh, chaos engineer already. Yeah, no, awesome. Some some evidence that I see like where I work with with you guys too, like, um, yeah. you know, builds, right? Because you're practicing and um, like you just said, you can be quicker to respond in the right way, right? Because yeah. you're more confident and you're prepped. And then also like so many times when you're building like prototypes, you know, for, for a project, you know, that MVP, yeah. all of a sudden that MVP becomes like production. <laughs> and then... Uh, if yeah. you're thinking like a chaos engineer, you can defend that MVP to your like product manager to be like, hey, this was just a prototype. Remember, we have to build yeah. in that resiliency first, right? Because it's going to fail in these conditions, right? So I think, right. I think that's you know good to be on the defense with that too. Um, if you're thinking like a chaos engineer, right, just to protect right. that customer experience. Um, cool. We got a new question in from Venu. Um, they say, how much chaos should be scripted with unscripted so that real issues can be found as surprise? After all, unknowns are unknowns. That's true. I mean, yeah, unknowns are unknowns, but um, there are actually, you know, there's so many tools in the market. It's not just Litmus, but uh, if you have security in place, if you because there's so many other things, the security chaos engineering, there is a kernel level engineering. There's so many things. So if you do use all those tools you kind of make the system in place that and you're also testing on staging and uh, you know pre-prod and things like that then i think you're sort of prepared because you of course can't know everything but that's why we have the concept of game days we have so many other mitigation strategies so you can you can only do your best you're only human <laughs> but yeah you can't predict you you can predict to a certain extent because you're you're sort of an expert in this field but yeah there's also a limit to the prediction so you would have to have those uh, mitigation uh, policies in place and hope for the best. I think, you know, there's definitely some failure modes out there where in the year 2024, um, you should just be resilient to like, like a single node failure, right? Like the old school chaos monkey test, like those, yeah. you don't need to be unscripted for that. Um, but if you're training the human, you know, the team to kind of like learn how to work with each other, learn how to like 
work through that stress than having like unscripted, you know, just kind of like game day type stuff um, yeah. is, you know, where you need to go for sure. Um, yeah. Cool. And uh, we've got another great question um, from Guy. So when first implementing chaos, do you start from observed issues on your application or do you think a more generic approach is suitable testing for memory, CPU and network issues overall? I definitely think um, taking examples from what we already have is a great way to start because you have, uh, you know, tons of other people who have experienced the same thing and uh, you can treat that as a starting point, but you know your application best. So if you think that that might not be the best fit for you, you can start with that and then you can move on to creating something of your own once you understand your system better because, you know, something that works for somebody else might not work for you. So that is a great way to start because you are observing how chaos is done and you're you're sort of confident that this network chaos works but it's not really you know helping in my scenario so that might be the point where you check your own services how it's communicating and sort of modify the same network chaos that you were using for your own use case is what i would suggest yeah great answer um let's see if there's any more questions to and uh kind of before, as we're Maybe we got a new question there. Oh, <laughs> so, but you said, I love dogs. Yeah, I have three dogs on my couch right now. Daisy's the big one. So she's sitting back there. So I love it. I, I was I had my background blurred, unblurred it just to have, you know, the real authenticity of the dogs there. So that's great. Um, cool. Let's see. Um, no more new questions. You know, one thing I was going to just share real quick, um, let's see if I can share my screen. Mm -hmm. Share. Um, this is not in presentation mode, but hopefully you can see it okay. Um, but for this Lipness Chaos Conference, um, we're having, you know, a contest. So post a tweet on X or post on LinkedIn tagging Lipness Chaos about your experience. Um, or your experience with litness in general. And then uh, top three posts will win some chaos swag, which we'll announce during the closing here in a few hours. So if y'all can uh, do that, that'd be great. If you normally don't tweet or post on LinkedIn, this could be your first opportunity. So we'll uh, be on the lookout for it as well. Um, and since we have just a little bit more time, we got one new question from Rama. Um, how can we create our own experiences in the litmus? Is there any SDK? So like, besides the chaos hub? Um, yeah, like how, how can we create some experiments? There is uh, definitely an SDK. Uh, you can go to the litmus go repository. I have it in my uh, presentation as well. Um, so it's if, even if you go to the litmus chaos repository, uh, like the organizations, you'll find a litmus go repository. You can clone that and it has the litmus SDK. So, and also the blog, if you go to litmus CSIO has the detailed step of how you can use the SDK, but just to kind of, you know, share in short, um, there, there is something called attributes or YAML, which is where you'll kind of create the artifact based on some certain blueprint. So we have the templates bootstrapped with the things you would want to update in that template. We make it very simple. Uh, if you're just starting out, then you can use it to create your own uh, Litmus uh, experiments. And then you can use that uh, by simply uploading the whole thing in Litmus. So when you upload that, you're basically running your own custom experiment. Also, there's a Litmus uh, Java SDK. That's a proposal going on in the community right now. So the current one is a Go SDK. But yeah, there's a Java SDK that's there in the issue list, which is a proposal. Nice. Yeah, so always looking for contributors to help out with that as well. So um, Rama, if you're looking for Java, um, feel free to you know tag yourself in that issue on the Litmus Chaos repo, or uh, as Sian mentioned, if you need to, if you're using Go, you know, go ahead with that. Um, you know, we start the workshop here in a few minutes, um, which will be a great opportunity to get your hands involved with Litmus. Um, one quick question from Venu also just said, you know, are there chaos scripting? Um, I'll make a plug for the Nokia presentation earlier in the day too. Um, that's been recorded as well. So you can kind of hear how Nokia is working with AI and chaos, but Cyan, if you have any 
insights there you can add? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of uh, to do, I would say, AI in chaos, because it's it's a very difficult subject because predicting chaos is really hard. There's There are tools like Gage, GPT, and like uh, Matt said, there's the talk by Nokia that happened. So there's a lot of people you know, chiming in with AI on the chaos market. But, you know, the hardest part that I think uh, is uh, predicting the mitigation strategy or, you know, predicting what is going to happen because uh, it's on the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's just AI. So a human or an expert would much better, you know, sort of scan your system and tell things that are actually real versus an AI. But yeah, there's, uh, there's definitely some open source uh, tools out there that can definitely help you all. But I wouldn't say, you know, anything that is, uh, super concise. Great. Um, so lots of questions. Thank you for asking that. That was very insightful for your answers too, Cyan. 